Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Welcome to the Sunday School lesson. Um, we are a ministry of the Rutherfordton Presbyterian Church. The lesson today is entitled The Greatest in the Kingdom, and the focal passage is Matthew 18, 1 through 9. We are in a three-unit study this spring. The first unit is called from the margins of society. Second unit is experiencing the resurrection. And third is the birth of the church. This is about Jesus calling and who he calls. Last week, we studied together the prodigal son. And today, again, the greatest in the kingdom. And this is actually a, a time with his disciples. The key text, therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's Matthew 18, 4. This lesson has basically three aims. First, to know Jesus' view of greatness. Second, to see the differences between Jesus' view and that of his disciples. And then identify ways in which we can humble ourselves like a child in our daily lives. Our lesson context today is we are in the journey with the disciples and Jesus during his three-year ministry. The disciples have been with Jesus for a, a long period of time. By the time we get to this Matthew passage, they have witnessed so very much in the time that they have had with him. Now, remember, the disciples are just people. They're human beings. They were at their daily work, and he called them, and they went with him. They knew in his teaching that he was saying that he was the Messiah. He taught from the Old Testament that they had learned. But the fact of the matter is, even though they had been with him through things like those teachings, and they had seen the divine power of, of his healing, they had seen his miraculous provision. And if you think about it, as we're looking at these words, you can think of the stories yourself when they saw them, um, when they saw and experienced Jesus in the middle, in the midst of these things. And then an exorcism and control over creation. And that's not hard. That's an easy one because you remember when the disciples are asleep in the boat and it gets all crazy and, and the, the things are just turmoil. And Jesus wakes from his sleep and he calms the waters. But there's so many times that the disciples has seen, have seen miraculous events as they have been with Jesus. But the whole time, every time when they're walking, there is intentional teaching. Even at this point, Peter, James, and John had seen Jesus transfigured. And Peter said at that time, he called Jesus divine use the words honor and glory to him. God's power was revealed through Jesus. They saw that. Peter acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, the living son of the living God, the anointed one. So there were members of the disciple group who really were starting to get a handle on the teachings of Jesus. Some of them honestly believed he was the Messiah. Was that 100%? No. You remember, Jesus has to go through a lot for us, for his disciples and for us. And so they are still on this journey. But some of the disciples are beginning to see what he's been teaching. But even with their recognition of Christ, they were still expecting the Old Testament version of the Messiah to come with power, strength, and might. You'll remember, uh, if you're a student of the disciples and their rela relationship with Jesus, that he seemed to get frustrated with them, or maybe we interpreted this frustration when he was trying to explain to them the kingdom of God. They were seeing it as a human kingdom. Well, we can't be too critical of them because we know who Jesus is, right? But they were learning who he was. 
and we're not to the the crucifixion and resurrection yet um so their image of what a king was or a kingdom was was this powerful structure and so the kingdom the kingdom of god was always present in their knowledge and thinking but many of them still believed that it was going to be you know when is this meek guy going to turn into this person that is this strength and powerful person all four gospels address the kingdom of god but only matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven scholars don't really have an understanding of why that is but the fact that it is uh, may very well be just his respect for God. And so saying the kingdom of heaven puts a, a more ethereal look at it and, and helps him grasp it better. Jesus' teaching prepared people to receive the kingdom, kingdom. That's what it was about. But you have to start where, where people are. And remember, these are just guys. These are just people who are, have responded to him. And so he's had to teach them as they have gone along. He said that people had to be born again and then obey the will of God. And then to learn how to be what our lesson teaches today. And that has to do with greatness. Matthew 18, one through five, beginning with verse one. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, let's just stop here for a second and remember these are just guys. Now, granted, they were guys who've been with Jesus and they've seen all these things, but remember what their concept of kingdoms is. And so they're probably thinking, you know, well, there's the king and then there's these this next level of pretty important people. One of the uh, Old Testament stories that comes to my mind is like the role of Mordecai you have you have some people who have some level of authority in there for a period of time so maybe they are saying okay out of us who's going to be your next in command who's going to be your chief of staff who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven so maybe I'm just putting human characteristics on them but they were human or is this really a question about they're trying to understand the kingdom of heaven? Either way, it's still a lesson for us. Verse two, this is Jesus. Jesus called a little child to him and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's going to put a question in your mind, right? they can't literally become children again and they can't be little again so what are they talking about unless you change that means change from how you are right now and become like little children you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven therefore whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven I think literally um, bringing a child in and sitting the child there and putting a focus on the child uh, helps them to see that they're not that. So they're going to have to start thinking, what is he really talking about? What do we know about children? Well, they come into the world pretty blameless, don't they? They come into the world for us to take care of. We either love them and do right by them, or we don't do right by them. And we have plenty of people in our country today where, where, who have evolved without the kind of love and nurturing that's needed. Um, you know, I was raised a Southern Baptist and we believed in believer's baptism, but I've come to appreciate the, ba the baptizing of newborns and young children in the presbyterian church because along with that service we are required as a congregation and the children are required to say we agree to play with them and the adults in the church are saying we're going to help raise them there's it's a commitment ceremony that we're not just going to let this kid loose 
this kid's going to be raised by us. And I think it sort of centers on this, this kind of passage right here. Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is in the great, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That baby comes to us absolutely blameless. So then what do we do with that blameless child? Now, Jesus isn't just talking about real literal children. He's saying that in the kingdom of God, we have to become that innocent and we have to become that trusting in order to actually move forward into the kingdom of God. We have to be that open. Now, does that mean we have to be a baby again? Well, in our thinking, we have to start over, certainly, because he says, he continues in this very short passage that we're looking at, he, he is very clear about what has to happen. Verse five, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So if you are a newborn Christian, if you're just trying to learn how, he's saying welcoming those people is the welcoming of me. So we're not just talking about literal children, but we're talking about whoever is attempting to understand, love, and, and move forward with this gospel of Christ. So then he uses some of the strongest language we ever hear from Jesus. Verse six, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. You know, we don't, see millstones on a regular basis anymore. Uh, you can go to a granary and see some where, but these were huge stones that rubbed against each other and that's how they separated wheat from chaff. So the picture that I, I added here gives you a sense of how big they were and how heavy, heavy they were. So what's Jesus saying? He said, if you do anything to cause this little child, this one who is learning, who is trying to be Christ-like, who is, who is moving in this direction, if you cause that person to stumble, then might as well have millstone around your neck and drown in the sea. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure you wouldn't float to the top. Verse seven. Now he uses one of those words that, that we see in the Old Testament pretty frequently. Whoa to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. There are several things in this verse that are interesting. One is the use of woe. That means, may I have your attention please, something bad's gonna happen. That's what woe is. Woe to the world. So where's he saying all this bad stuff's coming from? Because of the things that cause people to stumble. Well, that might have been true in Jesus' time, but it's certainly true today. The world has a lot of attractive stuff coming at us. So he's saying, woe to the world. Such things must come. So he's saying, yep, you know, there's sin in the world. Adam doesn't get the whole rap for sin, but we've had it since then. So yes, those things are there. And yes, they're in, present in the world but woe to the person through whom they come. So this has to do with, are we conduits of these sinful things that get in the way of other people? Are we producing the kinds of things that cause other people to stumble? If so, then woe. Verse eight, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter a life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. So very powerful again. Now, why does he use hands and feet? Well, that's what we use all the time to motivate and, and get us where we're going. If the feet are, are walking in the wrong direction or if we're eating the wrong stuff, picking up the wrong stuff, he's saying very clearly, so close to us, the, if these things 
are causing this breaking of our relationship with God or causing somebody else to stumble, then it would be better that they're absolutely cut off from you rather, rather than thrown into eternal fire. Heavy words for Jesus, verse nine. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. So why does he use eyes? Well, what are we looking at? What are we seeing? What are we spending our time doing? Now, living in the mountains of North Carolina, or foothills anyway, we have beautiful views all the time. I find it difficult to be unhappy living here. Even in bad weather, there's something beautiful around to see. Um, I am grateful that I live in a place where I can see God's creation beauty all the time. But what he's saying here is if what we are seeing with our eyes, in other words, what we pick up to read, what we're now, they didn't have TVs, but stick with me here. What we're watching on television, what we are pursuing with our eyes, what we are trying to see more of, if that stuff causes us to tumble, stumble, it would be better to have our eyes gouged out than to be thrown into the fire of hell. So how serious is he? He's as serious as he can possibly be. Now, what? remember what the disciples question was? Who's greatest? He's made it really pretty clear that you have to be humble and you have to keep your life in such a direction that we don't cause other people to stumble or to fall away from Christ. We've talked about uh, um, in the last several weeks or months about what it is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning. Uh, is the first, are our first thoughts about God, are our first thoughts about thanking God. Now, it's, it's great if you've got time to spend in uh, devotion and prayer right at the first of your day, that's great. But how much time in general do we spend in the Word, and how much time do we spend doing other things? And if you're like me, I have to say, ouch. But again, what this lesson is about is how do we become humble? So think about it. The world focuses us on power and greatness. We don't think when we're growing up that we want to be total failures. We think in terms of we have opportunities here in our country that a lot of people don't have. And we have freedoms that a lot of people don't have. And so somehow we get distracted thinking that we've got control of all of this because the world has focused us that way. <clears throat> Where do we get our messages about life's desires? What do we seek? What do we seek? Do we respond with Jesus' teachings to direct our attitudes and thoughts about greatness? Through the Holy Spirit, we must learn to embrace Jesus' definition, which is childlike humility. So if you're saying, how can I become as a little child? You can't do it by yourself. Can't do it on your own. We have the Holy Spirit, not something that the disciples could experience well at that time, but it is God's presence in us every day. And if we rely on the Holy Spirit, we're going to get that direction. We must also remove those temptations that would redirect us regarding greatness. Those things we see, hear, and do. What do you do in your daily habits? Are your daily habits involving God? Are your daily habits involving love? Are your daily habits involving sacrifice? What control do we have over all of this? Now, you might go through this lesson and say, my goodness, that's asking me to give a lot, up a lot. But I would suggest to you that God gave his own son. So what are we really asking to give up? Nothing. We're asking simply 
we are asked simply to be humble in the sight of God. But do we believe and demonstrate through our actions that God will provide for his people and show mercy consistent with his nature? Do we really believe in God and that he's going to take care of us and that he's going to provide for us and that he's going to show us his mercy? This is a hard lesson when you really think about it. Where we start is declaration that yes, God has that power. And I've got to learn to be humbled by it and be humble. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, transform our hearts and minds so that we will continue to seek the kind of greatness that is required in your kingdom. Orient our hearts toward the actions and habits that mark citizens of your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.